A dream. I saw a dream. A dream that wouldn't end. Over and over again, I repeated and corrected every mistake. But before I knew it, I lost count. I died over 100 million times. And yet there was still a place I wanted to reach. A wish I wanted to protect. No matter what, I had to save everyone. And that's why I took her hand. Natsuki Subaru woke the same as any other day except a voice was in his head. After forming the contract with Echidna, she's been able to communicate with him through sound waves and she can watch everything he does through the black crystal pendant hanging from his neck. With Echidna's help, Subaru was able to save the sanctuary, pass the trials, and protect everyone he cares about. But that didn't come without a cost. After dying over 100 million times, Natsuki Subaru was now a completely different person. He's desensitized to a lot of things and no longer fears death. He's become a new version of Subaru that abuses his ability as often as he prefers to. All the while, the Witch of Greed watches him in amusement. This is Kasaneru, the Greed If Story. As soon as he finishes practicing his smile in the mirror, Subaru touches the black crystal pendant he wore around his neck. As he held it in his hand, its presence grew stronger and started to pulse as if it was a living thing. The pulse grew faster until it was equal to Subaru's own heartbeat, and that was precisely the moment his consciousness left him. Without a word, Subaru sits down across from Echidna and gulps down his cup of tea with no reaction whatsoever. It wasn't that he had forgotten what the tea was made of, it had just been so long since he cared. You could at least say hello. There's no reason to. You're already prying inside my head day and night, so what's the point? This and that are different matters, you know. Greeting me properly is simply the polite thing to do. After all, I am a shy young maiden, as delicate as a flower. Did the meaning of those words change without me noticing? Echidna was quite tolerant towards Subaru's and politeness, so his sarcasm didn't bother her. She relaxes her mouth into a smile, which causes Subaru to accidentally admire her beauty for a moment. What's the matter? You're staring at me. She was a perverse, demonic figure that exuded a sensation of inescapable ruin and destruction but Subaru still found it difficult to be afraid of her. The two of them talk for a bit, but it wasn't typical for them to delve into idle gossip, so Subaru planned on returning to reality as soon as possible. Before leaving, he tells her that from now on, he's removing the pendant whenever he uses the bathroom. And then, despite her pleas for him to stay, Subaru exits the tea party without saying goodbye to Echidna, leaving her with nothing but a sigh. When his consciousness returns, he confirms that only a few seconds have passed, but he still wasn't used to the discomfort produced by the gap between worlds. <sighs> Maybe I'll never get used to it. Subaru spoke out loud, talking to himself, but Echidna was always listening and would often interject with her own suggestions, which began to annoy Subaru to the point that he asked her not to speak with him if it wasn't necessary. Yes, yes, I understand. I'll be silent except for when it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> you just made a witch obey you. You truly are a master at this. Shut the hell up! There was a sudden knock on Subaru's door, but having repeated this loop already, he knew exactly who it was. Right on schedule, Petra says good morning and explains that she's got plans to go shopping this afternoon. However, she doesn't know if the weather will be nice enough. 
They chat for a bit longer, and then Subaru visits the courtyard where Garfield was sparring with Reinhardt. Garfield fought with his full strength, but was easily defeated. Too weak to continue, Garfield left angrily to go wash off the dirt his body was covered with. Reinhardt, on the other hand, didn't even work up a sweat, and somehow the grass underneath him had returned to its original clean state. The thought of Reinhardt as an enemy gave Subaru the chills, and that's exactly why Subaru secretly led him to join the Amelia camp about a year ago. By convincing Felt to drop out of the royal selection and abandon the Estrella family, Subaru caused Reinhardt to feel depressed and out of place. With nowhere else to turn, he accepted Subaru's offer to support Amelia, but after being abandoned by Felt, Reinhardt was never the same. Because of his childhood trauma, Garfield was miserable as well, but instead of working through his trauma and solving the problems within his heart, Roswell and Subaru excluded him entirely and forced him to leave the sanctuary against his will. If they hadn't, he would have been eaten by rabbits, but the result of saving him was an unstable Garfield whose depression was steadily being converted into rage. Reinhardt became an outlet for him to release his anger, but even that only reminded Garfield of the strength he lacked. Talking with Garfield and Reinhardt wasn't intentional though, Subaru just happened to run into them on his way to the library. The mansion's library was actually where Subaru's daily routine was supposed to begin. Hey, Beatrice. Sorry to intrude. Beatrice said nothing and sat in a corner with her forehead pressed to her knees. In the past, she might have greeted Subaru with some form of insult, but now she wouldn't say anything at all. Beiko! Come on, don't you want to play outside? Subaru kept pestering her until she finally had enough and told him to shut up. Her voice was hoarse and she almost sounded like a different person. But hearing her voice at all was a big relief to Subaru because typically she wouldn't even speak a single word to him so today he felt pretty lucky. During the events of the sanctuary, Subaru forced her to leave the forbidden library that she swore to protect. Up until this point, Beatrice had dedicated her entire life to her contract. But now, that contract was broken, and so was Beatrice. In a deep depression, Beatrice spent the rest of her days incessantly sobbing, with a non-existent will to live. Subaru wrapped his arms around her to comfort her shivering body without knowing that he was really the one searching for comfort. But Beatrice hated it, so she clawed at his neck until it bled. Subaru eventually gave up and shut the door behind him on his way out, leaving Beatrice alone once more. Back then, I wonder if I should have lied to her. I could have said I was that person. Saving her life was the right thing to do, though it is a shame that her contract was broken in the process. Wait, hold on a second. Isn't it your fault that she ended up this way? Well, of course, I will take partial responsibility for the child's solitude, but my intent was certainly not to force misfortune upon her. I do hope you understand. Even if devastated by regret momentarily, there will come a day where that child is free again. In due time, someone will accept her. Perhaps that someone is you. There are an infinite number of possibilities, after all. <laughs> Finished with his conversation with Echidna, Subaru ran into Roswell in the hallway. Roswell appeared to be in an excellent mood, and there was a certain element of respect in the way he addressed Subaru. Roswell had come to appreciate Subaru's utility and respected him for all he's accomplished. Subaru wasn't too happy to be working with him though, especially considering all the trouble he caused at the sanctuary. However, Roswell was too great an asset to be cast aside. So reluctantly, Subaru cooperated with Roswell, and the two of them worked together towards achieving their respective goals. Because Roswell changed the way he acted towards Subaru, Rom did as well. She no longer insulted him or called him Barusu, she spoke with courtesy in a dignified manner as any maid would. However, there were no traces of familiarity or friendliness in her voice. She was distant and treated him as if he were an esteemed guest whom she had no prior connection with. In the room with Rom and Subaru, Rem slept silently in her bed as she has been for the past two years. At Subaru's request, Rom left the room, giving Subaru some alone time with Rem. Well, Rem and someone else. Hey, Echidna. For you to call me is truly a rarity. Could you remind me how to wake her up? Echidna explains that there are three possible ways to save Rem. 
The first is to find and question the sin archbishop of gluttony and try to make them reverse the effects of their authority. However, finding them would prove to be enough of a challenge and defeating them would be even more difficult and we don't even know if the authority can be reversed. The second option is about as equally unlikely as the first because it would require cooperation from the sage, which according to Echidna isn't a realistic expectation either. So we're really only left with the third option, which is to obtain the blood of the divine dragon. The omnipotent power in the dragon's blood would certainly be enough to wake Rem from her sleep. However, the dragon only offers his blood to the ruler of the kingdom. And that's why you absolutely must make Amelia the ruler. Amelia! Subaru knocks on Amelia's door and Amelia knocks back from the other side. She lets him in and they have a nice little flirtatious interaction, but Amelia changes when she notices the scratches on Subaru's neck. Immediately, she realizes that Beatrice was the one responsible, and then a large quantity of mana surges out of her body. The air starts to freeze, and Amelia loses control. Soon, the mansion and everything around it will turn into ice. Amelia, calm down! Everything's all right! Hey, Amelia, look at me! Subaru hugged Amelia's body and desperately called out to her. Eventually, she snapped back to reality after seeing Subaru smile at her. Earlier that morning, Subaru had practiced his fake smile in the mirror because he knew Amelia would need it. If she had continued to freeze the mansion, Reinhardt would have had no choice but to stop her and Subaru probably would have had to use Return by Death again. So luckily, the fake smile worked, Amelia calmed down, and the mansion was safe again. Amelia was so different from before because what she saw in the trial brought back painful repressed memories that continue to haunt her relentlessly. And because Subaru took the trials for her, she was never able to overcome her traumatic past resulting in an unstable, incomplete version of Amelia that was now entirely dependent on Subaru. I'd bet it would be more convenient for you if she were an emotionless doll that followed your every command. Subaru tried his best to ignore Echidna, but sometimes it was difficult to do so. Echidna disliked Amelia and would often make rude comments when she saw her. This really bothered Subaru, but not as much as the guilt did. He couldn't help but wonder if perhaps Amelia would have been better off without him. Whether or not he made the right decision was a question that constantly plagued Subaru throughout his daily life. Echidna would offer him reassurance, but it was never enough. The possibility of regretting something was terrifying to Subaru. After having a bit of a panic attack, Subaru hurried back to his room. He didn't want anyone to see him like this, but when he opened the door, he found a dark-haired woman sitting on his bed, smiling. Elsa was no longer an enemy. She wasn't exactly an ally, but in any case, she didn't pose a threat to Subaru anymore. In fact, Subaru was now her employer. She's been working behind the scenes doing the dirty work for the Amelia camp, and with Elsa's assistance, they were able to kill the Sin Archbishop of Greed and capture the Sin Archbishop of Wrath. However, Elsa's current assignment to track down the Archbishop of Gluttony was unsuccessful. Oh, Elsa. You were outside earlier, right? How was the weather out there? Elsa replied that the weather was fine, and Subaru nodded in confirmation, and then asked her for another small favor. I see. Thank you. Now, please take your knife and lop off my head. Oh, and try to make it painless. Elsa was a bit confused at first, but after confirming that Subaru was serious, she followed his order. Subaru's blood sprayed across the room and his consciousness faded away. With his final thoughts, he felt sympathy for whichever maid would have to clean up the mess. Elsa would sometimes question his sanity whenever he asked her to kill him, but would still obey him anyway, making her an excellent means of using Return by Death. When Subaru woke up, Echidna confirmed that he had reset to earlier that same morning. She also asks him why he used Return by Death, but he doesn't give her an answer. Once again, Petra knocks on the door and says good morning to Subaru. And just like in the previous loop, explains that she has plans to go shopping this afternoon, but doesn't know if the weather will be nice enough. 
However, this time, Subaru has a proper response for her. Rest assured, Petra. The weather's going to be nice today, so you don't need to worry. And that was the response he had died for. Subaru sacrificed his life to give Petra that information. A small, insignificant detail such as the weather was worth more to Subaru than his own life. Meanwhile, atop the hill in that meadow of green, the lonely witch let out a sigh. Using your own life to protect others is noble indeed. However, your ability, returned by death, is a double-edged sword. If the lives of others become too desperately consequential, you can no longer value your own. With all the afflictions and hardships that Subaru went through, he was unconsciously led to rely on the witch. And with Subaru's return by death ability at her disposal, Echidna held the world in her palm. You truly are someone who can satisfy me. She swore to wholeheartedly assist the boy with his own goals however she possibly could, but at the same time also intended to satisfy the inexhaustible curiosity of a witch. So from now forth, suffering and unreasonable fate would equally descend upon the boy for all eternity. His suffering would become her satisfaction. And that was the witch's love. Ah, <sighs> even so. A proposition that would remain sempiternally unsolved, and yet an enigma that would forever enthrall her. Why must love always fade?